with the kids. I get to get a kill. The hike might be rough the next day, but it could be a fun night. Was <laughs> <laughs> there anyone here? <coughs> Is it the planning board going to be here? No. Uh, they were all invited. <coughs> well, I read it online. Good, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Oh, it's the planning board. Board. Yeah. The board and housing sure, sure. Good. <laughs> yeah. How are you? <laughs> this wasn't listed on the calendar. It was only listed on the front page. It's not technically a public meeting of any kind. So no. I knew it was a dip. I saw it last night on the Twitter. It's not the answer. So I looked at it and said, it's not there on the calendar. <laughs> and then it was right in front of my face before it. Was there. Can you spot that? Sure. Uh, yeah, that is helpful. Yes, thank you. It's, although it's a little bit tough, we'll but I can remember all the words. I've looked at it in about two days. Look at the proposal. I was like, I was running out of the house and talking to Annie today. Yeah. The only reason I don't quit on them is because they agree with me. <laughs> at least we agree. It was funny. <laughs> it did make me laugh. Well. <laughs> it's recording, but it is live as well. So. Oh, okay. great. So you're out there. You're out there in the world. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay. For our tens of viewers. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for coming. Um, tonight um, we have with us um, Courtney Starling and uh, Roberta Cameron from Community Opportunities Group. They are our consultants that are helping the town put together an update of our mandated housing production plan. And I'll let them explain what a housing production plan is, but um, as town administrator Ian Schaefer, I'm very grateful that you two are here this evening to kind of guide us through this conversation. Um, this plan will be um, put forward for approval by both the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board in October. So it's important to get public feedback through this process, and this is our one public forum for this. Obviously, people who are watching this on TV and seeing it at a later date if you have any questions or concerns, they should feel free to contact me, and I'll forward those questions, concerns, um, feedback, etc., to the consultants so that they can be considered in the final document. So um, thank you both, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Uh, Roberta's going to do most of the speaking uh, once I stop talking to you. <laughs> And so, um, so I just wanted to say thank you for you guys coming. We're going to do a um, presentation tonight. It's a small group, so if you have questions, just raise your hand, um, and we'll kind of do them as we go through uh, so that you don't have to hold them and um, so that nobody forgets what they wanted to ask about, because I always forget. Um, and so with that, I'm going to just hand it right on over. The slide's over here, so if you get bored listening to us, just look over there. Um, the handouts that um, are in this gentleman's hand, uh, we do have a summary of some of the key data points from the housing production plan. And so we wanted to make sure everybody kind of just had those to look at, um, kind of to give some context, because it's one thing to look at in a lot of numbers, but we also wanted to talk about why you might care about them. And so most of the presentations about why you might care. <laughs> and so with that, handing it over to my colleague, Roberta, and she's going to take you away. Thank you very much, Courtney. And um, um, so I'm going to start off with, first of all, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this plan? And that is for two reasons. Number one, as, um, as Anita mentioned, it's mandated by the state to um, meet the minimum threshold of having 10% of your housing be affordable to low and moderate income households. And so this housing production plan will help you to reach that, that mandated level of affordable housing. The other parallel, just as important purpose of this plan is to help you identify what are your needs and what is it that is right for the town of Boylston. 
West, um, West, West, Boylston. West Boylston. I'm sorry about that. West Boylston. And really quick, as a pause, just to take, take the temperature in the room, everybody knows what affordable housing is in the capital A, capital H sense of the word? Yes? Okay. For the audience at home, in case you're watching, affordable housing that is officially considered affordable housing is housing that is eligible for inclusion on the state's subsidized housing inventory that is affordable to households making 80% of the area of median income up to, which in most places is about $104,000 this year. And so that's what it is. That's what we're talking about. It carries a deed restriction for a minimum of 35 years. That's preferred. Um, but that's what we should be shooting for, and um, there's the deed restrictions. That's kind of fair like, housing market. Ah, the, and it's and of course the most important part that the housing units are governed by a fair housing marketing and tenant selection plan to make sure that the units are being marketed broadly to get um, to make sure that there's a good audience uh, for those units, um, and that the um, units are then. Um, uh, the tenants are then selected via a lottery and so there's a housing lottery where people are chosen for the housing and so that's the nuts and bolts of it for our, our viewers and for everybody else you already know and th thank you for listening <laughs> thank you uh, so a couple of other things that i wanted to mention before moving on first of all is that under chapter 40b the state's affordable housing law communities who have reached that threshold of, mi of a minimum of 10% of their housing being affordable to low and moderate income households, they can continue to add affordable housing that meets their local needs, but they have the discretion to decide what meets their local needs. So communities that are below the threshold of 10%, the, um, a, a developer can, as you probably are aware, can override local zoning in order to build what the developer wants that may not be what the town wants. But you can, um, once you have reached that threshold, you have control over what kind of housing um, fits what you're looking for in the town. However, the state has decided to make it a little easier for towns to maintain this control even before they do hit their 10%. That's part of why we're doing a housing production plan, because if a town has an approved housing production plan and is meeting their targets on an annual basis, they can be put in safe harbor, which the state says, okay, West Boylston, you're really trying and you're doing a good job. You're not quite there yet, but you're doing what you're supposed to do, and we're going to let you have control over this. And that's why we're doing this. And so that's, that's the big get with the housing production plan. Not only do you have time to talk about you know, what, the, what the state's housing goals are for you, but also to talk about what's going on here and what your own goals are as well. And so this plan is for both of those purposes. Yep. Um, all right, thank you. So we begin the housing production plan. We're actually following a format that is given by the state of what the content of the plan ought to be. And the first item that's covered in the plan is a needs analysis to look at demographic data and housing market data to understand what, um, what's going on in your community and what your needs are. You actually had a housing needs analysis prepared about a year ago by another consultant. So you actually already were ahead of the game in understanding what it is that's driving the housing needs in your community. But, but we're going to talk about it again for a minute. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we... You know. um, so you have... I'm just going to run through what's on the screen, and this is also parallel to what is on the handout that we've provided. You have a population of not quite 8,000 people, and your population is projected to decline over the next uh, 15 years or so, according to... Um, the Donahoe Institute, which is a statewide data research um, at UMass, at UMass. <laughs> and so they are projecting a decline in population, um, although your senior population is not declining by so much. So the share of your senior population will be about half of the population, that is people over the age of 50. To which are not seniors, to be fair, that, yeah. lest we have anybody <laughs> that's 50 in here. But I just made that split because it's just like, all right, half of, half of you are going to be over 50 by 2030, so let's talk about what that means. And a, another interesting thing, this isn't on the screen, but it's on the handout, um, is showing that 
By current estimates, well, actually, not even current estimates, it, the only population group that has grown in the town in the last five to 10 years has been the prison population. And so you see on the, um, if you look at a breakdown of what the age groups are growing in the community. Real influx of young people. The, <laughs> there's a real <laughs> influx of young adults. The senior population is growing, but so is young adults. And the young adults are the prison population because they're counted along with everyone else but in the total population. The county so, jail, to be fair. So that, that was just an interesting factoid. Um, you tend to have um, a majority of your households are families, that is people who are married and or people with children. Um, close to 40% are seniors by another definition. I think um, seniors in this case is people 65 or 60 and over. We don't have all the numbers to remind me. <laughs> um, and about 26% are single person households. About a quarter of the households are just one person living alone. This is kind of an important thing because in a lot of places that's um, we see growth in senior households and we see growth in single person households. Um, senior, single person households are households of all ages, but of course we see growth in sing, you know single senior households and then, yes sir. <laughs> um, do you see a decrease in the, I don't know, like family age? Family with kids? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's projected to decrease and it, it has shown a little bit of a decrease. Really, the population has been about constant, I think. It's, it's hard to tell if the data, there's some inaccuracies with um, the data that's given. But it seems to be about a constant population. It's just that the senior share is growing and the family with children share is declining. Um, and one of the interesting things to note is that the senior population has a much higher rate of disability. So about, whereas 12% of the population overall has a disability, 30% of seniors have a disability, people o over the age of 65. And those can be cognitive, physical, or, um, or mental. And so there's, um, you know, there is an umbrella of disability there. And again, they're kind of like single person households, kind of like senior households, disabled households all have certain implications for what types of housing they might seek and what types of housing are going to work for their needs. Um, so next I'm going to jump down on the um, handout there. There's a, a second table on the front of the, or the second item, which is a table on the front of the handout shows um, median incomes for the town of West Boylston. Overall, the median income is a little bit high compared with the state and the region. That's 74,000 um, according to 2016 estimates. And that has gone down a little bit since 2010. And what's interesting is that, that the um, median household income for families that is all married people are all people with children is about 92,000 but the median income for senior households is just 49,000 which so, we would expect with adults that are not working and so the interesting thing that we're seeing in West Boylston is that the overall median income is declining but of working age adults, it is, it is growing. It is just a factor of the increase in senior households overall that is causing a decline, um, or you know, it, it's not growing as quickly. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting impact of what that does overall as you start um, getting into multiple households. Thank you. Um, so that's, um, we'll, we'll talk now a little bit, that's, that's giving an overview of the demographics, the demand side of your housing market. To look at the supply side of the housing market, um, again, referring to the data sheet, about a third of your housing was built in the decades 1940 to 1960. So of all of the houses in West Boylston, a third of them were built in that 20 year period. Um, that's fairly remarkable. Um, over 78% are, or about 78% are owner occupied and just over 20% are renter occupied and over 70% are single family homes with townhouse and two to four family homes comprising 20% uh, and um, then just about around 5% are multifamily. 
So why we care about that, whether it's rental or ownership, is because certain segments of the population have different needs about, have different abilities as to whether or not they can rent or own. And why we care whether it's single family or two family or townhouses or apartments is for the same reason as we need a bunch of, we need different price points and different, you know, whether it's different tenure, whether it's ownership or rental. We also need different types of housing units. You know, like, um, for example, somebody might be interested in renting an apartment, but they might also have small children, so they'd really like an apartment that has a patio where their children can play outside for a little bit, that kind of thing. Um, and so they might not want a large multifamily building. There are other people who want large multifamily because it has an elevator in it and maybe a concierge if it's swanky. And so, um, and so it really, so again, it really, um, why we look at like what's on the supply side is really about kind of making the connection between, okay, who would want to live, you know, who, who wants to live here and what do they want to live in? And then trying to make it match a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the last thing that we're going to look at in terms of the housing market um, is um, cost burden. Cost burden has a very um, precise definition. It means that people are paying more than they can afford for housing. Um, housing affordability is defined as paying no more than 30% of your income on housing. And um, households who are spending more than 30% of their household, of their income on housing are considered to be cost burdened. And we found that in West Boylston, um, about 29% of households overall are cost burdened. And renters have a higher rate of cost burden than homeowners. That's 39% renters and 30% of homeowners are cost burdened. And um, People, uh, seniors tend to have a higher rate of cost burden than households in um, lower age of householder. And people who earn less than $50,000 per year, 64%, more than two thirds of households who earn less than $50,000 a year are cost burdened. So that's really where the housing need is, is for the lower end of the income range and for, um, for seniors in particular. So we've summarized on the screen what are the overall housing needs based on this market analysis. Housing appropriate for seniors and disabled residents, rental housing of all types and sizes, moderately priced housing for ownership in the $200,000 to $400,000 range. That meets the needs of more of your households than um, more expensive ownership homes and deeply affordable rental units that are affordable to households earning less than $50,000 a year, which is about 50% of area median income. So earlier we mentioned that Chapter 40B mandates that housing be affordable to households earning no more than 80% of area median income. But if the housing is actually targeted at 80% of area median income households, those are not the households that are experiencing the strongest need for housing in West Boylston. It's actually households at a lower... Um, Officially 30 to 50% area median income, um, but it realistically it's the, the households earning less than $50,000 a year which on a fixed income is, you know, something that's um, entirely possible on, a, you know, it's, um, it's a large, it's a reasonable chunk of the population. And so it's uh, one of the more difficult types of affordable housing to build, but it is one of the most severe needs. Thank you. So now um, with that, that was the market analysis portion of the housing production plan. The next requirement is to look at goals. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're going to look at goals from two different angles. What are, what are the goals to meet the Chapter 40B requirements and what are the goals to meet uh, West Boylston's needs? Um, under Chapter 40B, uh, we've put a table on the screen that shows how we arrive at these numbers, but the 10% um, the threshold um, is based on the total year-round housing units in the last decennial census, which was 2010. 
So in 2010, you had 2,729 year-round housing units. And so 10% of that number is 273 housing units. That's the total number of affordable or sub SHI, so subsidized housing inventory units um, that qualify under Chapter 40B. And you currently have, this is with the completion of um, the new 40B development, 92 on North Main, um, you have 223. So you're actually somewhat close to meeting the minimum 10%. 52 sounds bad, but it really is not that bad, I want to say. It's fairly <laughs> close. Um, but the, um, unfortunately, within the next five years, the next decennial census is coming up. So we have looked at your housing development over the last 10 years to estimate what is it going to look like um, when the new census comes out in 2020. And so after 2020, we estimate that the total units you're going to need for the 10% threshold is 300. And that brings the number that you need um, to reach that threshold up to 79 units. Which you might have heard earlier when we talked about how 80 would be a really good number in the 87 Maple expansion, and that would be why, is because when we do hit 2020, we're estimating based on the construction between uh, 2010 and 2018, and we're guessing about 2019, uh, but we're, we're estimating that you're gonna end up around uh, 3,000 households thereabouts, and so, or 3,000 housing units, and so, uh, with that increase, it does bring you know it does bring us up a few more units than where when when we were at 52, but 79 is a is a reasonable number and it can reasonably be accommodated at um, potentially at the 87 Maple project, or possibly not. We'll see what happens. But a good <laughs> or not, we'll not talk about 80 ever again at that project. <laughs> so if so if the if the you know the project that's being considered right now between the housing authority and the Trust brings in the 60 or so, then that means that we need to find roughly 19 other types of housing units to work on within those five years. Yes, and yes. 60 most certainly will get you safe harbor, and so that will buy you a little bit more time, and so, um, so that's something also to consider. But uh, 60 would be excellent progress. Uh, 19 is not, and you know not an insurmountable number, particularly when you start imputing it for um, the housing targets. So the housing target itself they want you to hit, is it one and a half percent of whatever you're missing? Yes. When, yeah. And so, um, and that here is what, 14 a year? Yes. Yes. So for, to hit, to, for safe harbor it is 14 units a year right now. And so that's, that's kind of a number to keep in mind. 14 also I think sounds like a lot of the time, but then when you think, of um, 87 maple and potentially doing 60, it's it's not necessarily insurmountable. That would offer two years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so looking at the other side of the, the town's goals for affordable housing, we reviewed a number of plans that you've prepared in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. It was your master plan, a previous housing production plan, and a uh, street, a, a, a regional strategy for so um, West Boylston, Boylston, and Sterling uh, regional housing strategy. Uh, there's the needs assessment. There's Dick Heaton's work. So there's um, there's the last master plan. So there's a fair. You guys have been busy. <laughs> so from these plans, we distilled three goals that I think really encapsulate what you're looking for, for um, new development in general and in, in particular housing. Number one, to, provi to provide a variety of housing options that meet the incomes, needs, and lifestyles of a diverse population without taking away the appeal of West Boylston as a small town. Number two, to provide all of its citizens with the greatest possible spectrum of basic services directed at publicly expressed, publicly expressed community needs at the, latest, at the least possible cost. And number three, to continually support a strong economic base for the community. So these are the goals that we've kept in mind in looking for strategies to meet your housing needs. 
So the, um, the Department of Housing and Community Development in providing guidelines for what a community, what a housing production plan should look like has um, a set of categories for strategies that they're looking for communities to consider in the housing production plan. So we have looked at all of these strategies and considered strategies within the categories of zoning amendments to facilitate housing development, identifying sites where, where comprehensive permits or house, affordable housing development under any circumstances would be encouraged, town-owned land appropriate for affordable housing, characteristics of housing that the town prefers, and opportunities for regional collaboration. And just because it's really not possible to, for the town to accomplish any of these things without it, we always add strategies to increase technical capacity so that you have the ability to pursue any of the strategies listed above. The state likes the first five, we like the how do you get there one. So that's, that's our flair for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about zoning because that's kind of one of the things that I do and I will admit that this is a very si silly example that I started pasting on one of your existing buildings. Um, but the thing about it is that um, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think that you have a lot of land or desire left for large apartment buildings. And so fundamentally what I want to look at here is what we can do with your existing land to you know, tweak it just a little bit so that you can kind of help get to where you're going. You can kind of improve what's going on without fundamentally changing how everything looks and you know how it feels to live here. And so ignore my silly dormers, but the one thing that I do want you guys to think about is there's a lot of flat development here. A lot mm -hmm. of the buildings are single story. And particularly in your villages um, and with some of the properties that are for sale, if you could mix the uses and have upper floor residential, that would be something that would potentially add, you know, might not be affordable housing units, but it would add some different kinds of housing units that might actually be very useful. You know, the old uh, model of the uh, shopkeeper with the apartment above is still a valid model. And so that's the sort of thing that we want to make sure that zoning will encourage and will allow to happen. And I will paste on some trees, but it, the basic idea is kind of to always look at what you have and think about if it could be just a little bit more. You know, because nobody wants, you don't want to see a bunch of ugly new things coming in. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes, you know, radical amounts of change at one amount at one time. And so again, it's silly looking, but it is really about looking at your own assets and what you can do with it. Um, this is kind of another idea. It's a spin on the same thing of something that you have here with a little bit of vision could be something that might arguably be nicer that you could accommodate you know like multifamily housing doesn't need to be you know 40 unit buildings it can actually be done in 8 to 12 and it can be done with affordable housing units in it you guys have a bylaw that allows you to increase density for affordable housing and if it's on sewer it's up to 200 percent of the base density and so it's you know you have some rules on the books that can be taken advantage of a little bit of it is just making sure that the density is enough and making sure that you can use it to do things that, you know, again, this fundamentally isn't that different from the old veterinarian's building outside of the fact that it has more than one housing unit in it. Um, though I recognize that that building might not be salvageable. It might be a demo. It, it, but I'm not going to cast that aspersion on anybody else's property in a public meeting. I'm just, tr again, trying to encourage people to think about what the things are that are here and um, you know, and what might be acceptable if, if you know something's not necessarily right now at its highest and best use. What might be? What might be? You know, can can these people? You know, who owns it? Can they be approached? You know, are they interested in maybe doing something? You know, are they just kind of riding it out right now because they're not really sure what they want to do? And so a little bit of it is kind of like coordinating with you know, figuring out what these things are and having some conversations. And based on those, if you need to make some tweaks to zoning to make these things happen, it's kind of a good thing to do. It's, you know, it's a, a small thing that makes a big thing happen. Um, you know, and talking about underutilized properties, I'm sure you're all familiar with 114 Worcester Street. Um, that's just, it's just, it's a stone's throw from here. 
um, the Route 12 West Boylston Gateway, I'm kind of just using it as an example because um, your zoning uh, for your commercial properties requires one acre zoning minimum. And so what you end up with are a lot of these little buildings with a sea of pavement around them and then the next one acre lot with a little building and a sea of pavement around them. It's not that you're out of land, it's just that your land could be doing more for you. And so, um, so I don't want to, you know, bark up any trees about developing anything that's remaining. You are sitting right on an ox, or if you're sitting right on the um, Wachusett Reservoir, there's major DCR regulations. You don't necessarily need to be using your land for a ton of housing. And so, really fundamentally, what I what I want to try to encourage is just looking at what you've got and trying to maximize it without turn, you know, without having to throw out the farm. Um, the building on the lowest part is in Bedford. Bedford. Um, and so that's probably a little bit more than you guys might want to be doing, but it is just kind of the example of, you know, same amount of land, different idea. And so, you know, where you can have upper floor residential and first floor commercial, people kind of like it. They like the village thing right now. And so, and developers like to build it because it's, um, you know, it's a good product and they're selling it. And so that's kind of one of the things that is, um, you know, just again, it's an idea. It's not something that anybody has to commit to. Um, because the state does want us to identify your appropriate sites for affordable housing, we're obviously going to identify 87 Maple Street as your town-owned property. Um, there is some additional town-owned land on Paul Tyvenin Way, or Drive, excuse me. It's zoned conservation and desired for recreation, if I'm not mistaken, so I'm guessing that the town is not going to use that property for affordable housing. Um, and so absent of that, I don't really see, you need your schools, you don't have surplus town garage, you don't, you don't have much in the way of surplus property. So we're kind of looking at that at 87 Maple Street as your town owned. Um, from the rest of that, it really is looking at private property. And so um, sometimes there are opportunities with fraternal organizations. Um, there's the Masons, there's the Odd Fellows, the VFW was sold but isn't doing anything right now. Um, and so sometimes there's opportunity at those buildings. Um, there's conversions again, uh, kind of looking at like the old vet, if, you know, there might be a few old houses, particularly in the villages that are rather large that might be good to, you know, convert um, without making any exterior alterations. That's a good way to get more units without really it being noticeable. Um, and then looking at some of the underutilized commercial sites and whether or not you want to keep those in single use commercial or, use, or mixed use with commercial and residential. Um, you want me to do this one or do you want to? <laughs> we didn't talk about this slide. I'm yeah. sorry, guys, interrupting. Okay. I'll, I'll give it a shot, and I'm sure that you'll jump in. You'll think of something that I didn't. Um, so we um, looked at defining what are your housing preferences based on your needs and your goals. Um, for and what people have told us so far, to be fair. So this is, this, is definitely, this is definitely the part where we're looking for more people to chime in to let us know. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what we've heard so far in terms of housing preferences is first what, what housing the town needs to meet, uh, to serve current and future needs, um, what kind of housing fits in the town of West Boylston, and what are the price ranges that are needed. Um, so first, the housing that's needed to serve current and future needs is housing for seniors and disabled people, as we mentioned earlier. Small and medium scale apartment buildings, that's something that you don't have a lot of right now and apartments with three or more bedrooms that are suitable for families is something that there's not a lot of in the town right now. The family housing is important in particular because of the school system. There are certain fixed costs involved with running a school system that do not change regardless of the number of students. But if your student population continues to decline, the state's reimbursement is not enough to carry the cost of the school system. And so right now you're in a situation where your, your school kid population is getting low and it's getting to the point that, the, that it is difficult to sustain the system. So some additional kids would be helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Just saying, it would be helpful. <laughs> what kind of housing fits? Um, <laughs> All right, back on track. <laughs> that was funny, though. <laughs> So 
so housing that, that, that fits in West Boylston is complementary in scale, massing, and style. What does that really mean? It means that, so if you're in a house of post-war single family ranches, that you're not gonna put a four-story apartment building next to it because that is not something that is complementary in scale. That is like two very different scales. And so um, one of the things, and so by being complementary and by reflecting environmental sensitivity, we're talking about both the fact that yes, you have a lot of DCR regulations and we wanna make sure that the stormwater management is up to par, that we're not doing pesticide application, that the management is, that the management is wonderful. We want that, but we also want it to also fit in. We don't want it to stick out like a sore thumb. We don't want it to be the project that everybody drives by and it's just like, I hated that when I saw it the first time and I hate it now. And so it really is, you know, it goes kind of back to the previous slide again about thinking about what you have and um, what, you know, even if it, you know, what small changes can be made that would, would actually make a difference without changing life as everybody knows it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then in the price ranges we talked about earlier, um, especially housing at the um, lowest assisted rental levels, 30 to 50 percent of area median income. Moderately priced rental units below 1800, which is kind of what the average is right now if you're trying to rent um, apartments in West Boylston. If you find an apartment available, it's probably going to be in the order of 1800 a month. Um, and hope you don't need three bedrooms. Yeah. For children who aren't also paying rent. <laughs> <laughs> And ownership units, as we mentioned earlier, priced below 400000 That price point in particular has a lot of competition between first-time home buyers and senior downsizers. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult point, price point to build new construction for, for sure. But it is nevertheless the, um, the area in the market that um, has just no give whatsoever. And it's, um, it's problematic. At the highest demand. Um, so we've provided, actually in the top right corner, an illustration of an affordable housing development that we've seen recently in another community that we work in. Is that Cushman? Uh, yeah. Oh, no kidding. That's, I haven't seen it built. <laughs> that started as a two-family historic house that was at one point used as a, as a retail store and then abandoned for some time, and it was in danger of demolition. And um, the historical society actually petitioned to find a developer to take this house on. And they, they found a partner. And this, they used a 40B comprehensive permit to develop this. Oh, as, we did that, look, we did it under uh, inclusionary. Really? I, I thought, we inclusionary, did? I thought that that was 40B. I thought they had a comprehensive permit. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Either way, <laughs> either way, they work together with the town to agree on a mutually um, beneficial solution. There are eight units in this building, including one three-bedroom unit. Two of the units are handicap accessible, and two of the units are affordable, including one of the accessible units. So this is an example of projects people love: historic preservation affordable housing, housing for people with disabilities. So it is, it is possible. That's what it's a trifecta. The, the main thing that we want to say is that it is possible, really, but the, the, the thing about it is that you really do kind of have to pick your sites, pick the projects that really, you know, it does take a little bit of vision of being able to see what was a really broken down house, um, which is the front portion of it. You would never, it, it, it didn't have walls, folks but is preserved, but it, you know, it's those sorts of projects that people really can kind of get behind because they turn out all right. Yeah. Are all of the units affordable? In no. this building, no. Um, but he has done, the same developer is actually working on the property next door, which is a slightly larger building with 12 units and three of those are affordable as well. And they're rentals? Or in they're rentals? rental. And so, um, They've been, in that community, they prefer the scattered site, small building approach as opposed to doing large projects. And mm -hmm. generally speaking, um, it's... Uh, Which town is this? Medfield. Mm -hmm. and they're, so their affordable housing trust has been proactively working with developers to find projects like this and carry them out. 
And in their case, the technical assistance that they usually offer is helping the developer with their 40B application and that sort of thing. They're not currently subsidizing units or um, helping with property acquisition. That's something that they do intend to do in, a, in the future, but um, this is kind of one of the things that they do on the side as part of their bigger strategy with some other projects that they're supporting. But it's working out pretty well, I will say. <laughs> How long does it take for a project to turn around, like when they start trying to find one of these things? For this for one, um, for the one in the picture, that one was a bit of a slog because uh, it had some... It, What's a slog? A slog. Uh, it took, that, the first one took a while, but the permitting was really fast once everybody agreed on what was going to happen there. The second one, the over-under from uh, application to uh, CO for the end of construction, I think is going to be 24 months. Really? Yeah. Well, the first one required, you know, everybody wasn't on the first case. The first one, you're inventing the wheel. And so it took a lot of time. First, the, the partnership with the Historical Commission was taking place before the town had even made this commitment to step up its affordable housing production. Mm -hmm. So it was fortuitous that two different groups had, this, had an idea at the same time that could work together. But, it, you know, it took years for that to happen. But once, the, once they knew what they wanted to do and how to do it, they could take that model and, and uh, execute it quickly. They also have a similar project to the 87 Maple Street expansion. Theirs was called Pleasant Village, where they're also looking at a housing authority project and entering into an RFP with a developer to do a land lease to develop and manage affordable housing on one of their sites. Uh, and we'll also be pursuing tax credits. I think you guys are a little ahead of them, so keep going. <laughs> <laughs> about how much um, town That's money nice. investment the, for them? In this for, for like the larger project that you just mentioned? For the Tilden Village expansion, that's not clear yet how much the trust is going to be putting in. And that's really going to depend, because they don't have the developer yet, and so it really depends on that package, um, how their funding works, where the gaps are, if the town needs to provide gap financing, if the low-income housing tax credits come through, <laughs> like like 87 Maple, it's got all of the same moving parts. And so those projects, um, it'll really depend on what the project needs to be successful as to what the trust is going to need to do to support it. That's not clear to me yet, but typically it, typically it's cash and it's gap financing for the difference between what you can get a construction loan for and the actual price on the project. Yeah. And so that's that's usually where um, that's usually where the towns are actually most useful in investing because that's the hardest cash to get. So what's your experience with other projects? With respect to? to the, the CPA money being so advanced. That's, that's a great segue actually to the next slide that we're going to talk about. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where we're going. <laughs> We've been thinking about that. Um, so some, some options, some ways that you can use your affordable housing trust, your CPA funds to be able to support affordable housing. Uh, first be, of all, let's actually make sure that we're making a good distinction that the affordable housing trust can be capitalized obviously by more than just CPA funds. It is the primary funder, but people can also make donations if anybody is watching. <laughs> and there are a number of, you know, they, there are fees and other ways to collect, um, there are other ways to make, um, to produce funds, but primarily it will be through CPA. So I just want to make the distinction that we are not taught, we are not committing your CPA funds, but we are saying that they are one of the funding sources and the rules for housing trust and CPA funds are very similar. So um, in addition, so we've been talking about um, the affordable housing trust being able to uh, foster partnerships and provide technical assistance to help these privately funded affordable housing developments take place. Some other things that, that you can do is to facilitate the conversion of existing housing in your community to be eligible for the subsidized housing inventory without building anything new. Um, Two ways to do that, you can buy the unit as a town and put a deed restriction on it, or you can pay the owner for a deed restriction. Hmm. So um, you can, uh, for example, purchase and resell an affordable housing unit. You purchase it, put the deed restriction on it, and resell it so you regain, recoup some of the funds that you put into it. Let's say there's a super cheap condo that comes on the market and it's in pretty good shape, and it's cheap might be a good opportunity to you know, purchase, put a deed restriction on and either resell it or keep it as a rental. Um, so uh, another uh, very related would be to um, kind of in reverse, 
income quali to, to have a housing lottery to identify prospective home buyers and income qualify them so that they could buy an affordable unit. And then you tell them to go find the affordable unit and they, you help them to reduce the purchase price by subsidizing it in exchange for putting a deed restriction on it. So That's you can subsidize way. a person instead of a unit, if you want to think of it that way. And either way, you get a deed restriction in the end. Um, so that's, that's one approach. Another is facilitating new housing development. Um, so again, and that's talking about our zoning, it's talking about our 87 Maple, it's talking about maybe a friendly 40B at some point in the future should something so desirable occur. So one option, since you've identified that, one, that your highest need is for more deeply subsidized units, to simply work with a developer who's building subsidized units and deepen the subsidy so that those 80% area median income units become 50% area median income units. Um, or to increase the number of affordable units in a development. If they're going to provide two units, ask for three and pay for the third one. So uh, that's one way. To provide, um, so as we talked earlier, as you may um, look at doing for the 87 Maple Street, um, perhaps some um, pre-development funds or gap funds will help to um, get that project into the pipeline. Pre-development funds are usually used for things like surveys, engineered drawings, um, lawyers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lawyers are good. Your finance people, um, your professional help, and also your design stuff. Yep. And, yep. So that, I think that, that covers um, the suggestions that we were going to make for Affordable Housing Trust potential actions. One of the things that, that could be helpful for the Affordable Housing Trust would be to develop a plan outlining what specific actions um, the trust would take over the next five years out of a menu like this and what are the preferences that you would apply in working with a developer to create um, a um, friendly 40B project. Or let's say the trust decides that, you know, it sounds like a really reasonable and like fairly straightforward thing to do would be just to go the deed restriction route, watch the market and pick up maybe two properties a year or something like that. Cool. But let's say 10 properties are for sale. How do you pick which two? And so having some criteria about what you would be interested in would be really helpful as, you know, particularly as opportunities arise because it kind of can get a little political when you start buying things. Um, that if you have like a good set idea of just like, you know, we really, we really want two families. We want to buy duplexes. And so when two, you know, we want two families, we want them side by side instead of um, on top, instead of staff. And so, okay, so maybe the trust ha elects one person to kind of watch the market. Maybe the trust has a realtor on it. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. But, um, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, maybe there's somebody who's already watching the real estate. And so that's the kind of thing that if the trust decides that's something that you want to do as one of your activities, kind of good idea to have, you know, to say, hey, you know, we're going to put most of our eggs in the 87 maple basket. But at the same time, these are kind of like two or three little things that we can do to pick up those other 19 units and, you know, pursue those things. And again, have some criteria in advance, because it is true that when you go to buy things, people then start to say, well, they either say that's perfect or they say, you know what, the one next order would be even better regardless of the fact that the one next order isn't for sale. And so, um, you know, again, it's good to be very clear before you set out what it is that you're going to be doing. Thank you. Do you want to talk about the examples of other resources? Sure. <laughs> so, um, so you may have noticed that the state wants to talk about regional partnership. And people who, um, and so we want to talk about ways in which regional partnerships may actually be beneficial for you. Uh, so uh, one thing that has happened in recent time has been the partnership with Smock to Build Housing. And Roberta will remind me. I don't think it Freedom was Village, Freedom Village. Freedom Village. Yes. I knew it was an Afro Terrace. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, Smock was the uh, so Smock was the partner for Freedom Village. They are part of the Greater Worcester Housing Connection. They do a number of things actually. Um, they do uh, a lot of homelessness and assistance uh, for people with um, struggling with addiction or other uh, disabilities and issues like that. Uh, they do rental assistance. They do down payment assistance for home buyers, and they're also development partners and work with the towns. And so, um, kind of a range of services 
Uh, one thing that is true is that towns are not necessarily in the position to be a service provider for all things. Homelessness services frequently is one of those things that is slightly more difficult. Than, um, and so being sure that you're aware of the resources on a regional level so that when that does come through town that there are places to direct people if the town does not have those resources themselves. Um, our CAP solutions, they do um, monitoring and uh, management of low income uh, and subsidized housing. Uh, a lot of the, people use them for a variety of things, but that's the main thing that I'm familiar with what they do. They do REAC inspections for HUD. There's kind of a variety of things that they do under their umbrella. Um, Habitat for Humanity has an office in Worcester. They're pretty active in the region, though they haven't been active in West Boylston up until this point. I don't know why, but we, somebody could probably ask them. And so um, that, they're actually a very good partner too when you've been able to identify, um, again, we said that you can kind of, uh, you can subsidize a unit or a person. They tend to be a good person when you find an eligible household to actually make a house happen for that household. And so they can be a very good partner in that respect. They don't do large projects, they do largely single family homes, sometimes a duplex. And so again, that's not gonna be one of your 100 unit projects, but could be a small, you know, a small step chipping away at your 79. Yes, sir. I have a question about this, uh, not building a house, with, but helping a, a person. Mm -hmm. How does that politically work? I mean, how does a town say, I'm going to pick a person? And if, so what you would have to do is have a program defined in advance through which people can apply. And they would be people who could apply to any affordable housing program. They have to be income qualified, and they have to respond to uh, to a lottery, essentially the same way that they do um, any 40B housing. And so that, that household could be pre-qualified, and then if you provide the subsidy to them, you actually are essentially helping them to buy the house. You put capital into the house, they put their capital, they, they borrow the remainder of the money needed to buy the house, but you then, place a deed restriction on the house um, in exchange for the capital that you've played, that you've put up. To so them. essentially you help give somebody the money that they need to get their down payment to get there and to get a, a, pay, a monthly payment that they can afford. Not one of them adjustable rate balloon get ups, but like an actual mortgage for big grown up people. And um, so sometimes it's actually helpful that, you know, that if you select households and say, okay, you're pre-approved for your mortgage, you're gonna be able to get X amount of money, let's find a housing, then you go find some housing that you can afford and we'll pay, the diff we'll pay that gap between, you know, what it takes for you to get to that payment and to be and able to- In exchange for that- In well, exchange for that, the town the gets, gets the read deed restriction. So instead of paying $200,000 to construct a new unit, you can maybe put 20 in to help somebody buy a house and get a deed restriction. And there is, the, it, the, the, a program like this does come with administrative requirements. So it's- um, so there's some difficulty associated with it, but again, one of the things that we always want to look at is different ways that you can create units at different price points, because it's all going to depend on opportunity, so it's not like we can say, oh, you know, go and do a bunch of those, because we can't necessarily predict that that's going to happen, but we can say that is a lower cost way to get some restrictions. It, it, it can be very politically unpopular to choose to subsidize households if they do not understand that the town is getting a big get in exchange. So politically, it can, um, you know, it's it's a difficult it's difficult to kind of to get people to understand the way that the money works, and so because it's just you know it's just it's not that straightforward. It's like it's kind of like a buy down, yeah. And so um, so that so it's really more the public education component is more is a bit of a challenge there, but it is actually one of the ways that um, that you can get a restriction for relatively low cost. Another, um, you know, another. One way is sometimes town money can be used, or trust money, or that sort of thing can be used for, let's say, an infrastructure project that would open up development opportunity for housing to happen. Uh, frequently, I see it usually with like mass works grants where people are going to run a road with sewer and water um, for a short amount of, you know, for a short distance to serve a new development. And so, not having to pay the cost to run a sewer and gas and water line and build a road and getting a state grant for that and using, you know, using your public money to do the matching fund, because if you want a math works grant, usually they want you to put a little bit of your own cash in. Um, you can use that cash to leverage it. And again, um, you know, it might be $200,000 that you need for the matching grant, but what if they build 60 affordable units in exchange? And so um, the rule of thumb is generally about $200,000 per affordable unit being the cost. Um, in Eastern Mass, it's 
not correct, but in, you know, mm-hmm. but here that's about it's about the cost of the provision of a new unit. So if you can find ways to get units online for less than two hundred thousand dollars, that's always a good thing. Two hundred thousand dollars of downs. Invested. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, just 200000 is considered the ballpark of what that's right, subsidy is. Right, but if you had a family that was trying to do it and they had 160000 exactly. and you only have to put in the 40, it's... And you get a whole, you you get a whole deed restriction out of it. And so that, a whole unit for 40 is it's right. not, it's not the worst price. Um, in addition to your other, uh, you have your Regional Housing Authority Consortium that you're currently pr- participating in. You have CMRPC for your planning. Um, I know that they've been doing a little bit, is it a complete streets project or, yeah. Um, so they've been in town chatting with you a bit. Um, the Mass Housing Partnership also does technical assistance. They do a lot of trainings and those sorts of things like board member trainings. Um, one of the frustrations with 40B especially is that they are big developments that people don't necessarily have everything that they need to be able to review it, you know, unless you have, um, you know, like if your planning board has an engineer on staff who's really good at stormwater, that's really cool, but if they don't, they don't. And so, um, and these are things that are important to review, and so that's one of the things mm-hmm. that um, they can offer assistance with. Uh, Mass Housing is a good funder. They do, they have great first time home buyer programs, and so if you want to, again, help people as they come in, connect them with resources, uh, Mass Housing is pretty good. Um, they have the first time home buyer, they have the soft second, they have veterans loans. And on the other side, they do um, they do some uh, investing. Um, they do some loans for developers, but that's mostly um, Mass Housing Investment Corporation. Uh, but and so there is um, so and that is an important thing to mention too is that there's lending on both sides for both people seeking affordable housing and also for people seeking to build it. Um, which is, gets over to the other side. Uh, LIHTC, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, um, given Maple, uh, but that is the tax credit program where. Um, which is also kind of complicated to explain, but basically it's purchased, it's subsidizing for 10 years because of the value of tax credits. If you pay 75 cents for it and they pay you a dollar, it's all. Um, and so that would be good. Uh, the one weakness with LIHTC though, again, is that the subsidy only lasts for 10 years. And so after that, it, it really does become a bit more of a challenge, particularly uh, since these do tend to be more deeply affordable buildings. So finding a, lo- a way to fund it sustainably and long-term beyond that 10 years is something to think about. Um, MassWorks we talked about and MHIC we talked about as well. And so again, it's just looking at um, who needs money and why. And that'll kind of tell you which way you need to go. And again, on one thing that we don't talk about that often, but is also there for affordable housing purposes, is that the commercial banks do actually have uh, first time home buyer programs as well. Uh, They have programs that are targeted to specific zip codes and things like that um, that help uh, people make purchases in different areas. And so um, not everything needs to be a public resource. um, And so it's also just important just to know where the other ones are kind of hiding out in case you want to point people over in that direction. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, back. Could you go back one? I sure can. On the funds side of things, um, when you're trying to find a developer who's going to work on your project yes. in town, um, do the affordable housing trusts find the fund source or do you really go to the developer and they find the fund? It's the developer's problem. Okay. Right. Good. I mean, until it becomes your problem, like if something really like falls through for them, that's kind of the point where I was talking about gap financing where it might be, there might be a point in the project where trust funds would be very helpful. Um, but generally speaking, if you issue an RFP for somebody to develop, uh, part of what they submit back to you is a pro forma that shows you the financials of how they plan to actually make it work, and that's their young, that's their justification for the unit count. And but that's their plan. That's their plan, and usually you do ask for information regarding who. Um, usually, you have them get pre-commitments for loans and things like that to make sure that they're legit and not Absolutely. wasting your time. But yeah, let them do let them do it. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. Uh, <laughs> so this is a, the the last slide, I promise. Um, uh, we're getting to the end. So the last thing that we said we would talk about is is increasing your capacity to be able to advance these kinds of initiatives. First um, is to look at organizational capacity, um, both in terms of staff and in terms of your volunteers who are facilitating this to be able to have sufficient staffing and um, 
well-educated volunteers who are qualified. Qualified. Yep. Great. Now, um, I'm sure you guys are well aware that what you've been doing um, historically has been hiring housing consultants. Not to talk us out of a job or anything, um, but um, should you guys decide that you want to take on bigger things, um, you might want, again, not to talk us out of a job, I mean, we can come here more, but uh, you might want to think about, um, particularly because housing is very complicated, it requires a lot of expertise and it requires a fair amount of oversight, especially making sure that your units are properly resold or re-rented, that you don't lose uh, restrictions. Um, something that might be helpful, people do this multiple ways, um, is either to consider the creation of a town planner position, which would help you on the development side and managing the permitting and making sure that you're getting nice stuff, while also handling the housing stuff. That would be a great planner to get. Other people uh, hire a housing coordinator. They might have their own. They might share with a couple of towns. Um, but that's another way um, to uh, kind of increase local capacity. Because if you want to, if you want to take on bigger, you do need more people home. The planner has to be on the revenue of the town. It generally, can't be done with CPA funds. Generally speaking, the town planning portion of their position cannot be paid for by CPA right. funds, but the housing planning can. And so we frequently see um, we we see positions that are cobbled together, usually from a combination of town and CPA sources. When it's a housing coordinator, they're almost always CPA only. If we went with the regional route and shared a housing coordinator with other communities, again, the CPA funds could be used for our portion of that expense? Yeah. What is unpopular about that is the, perce the perception that you're spending town money outside of the town. Um, people are very sensitive about that, particularly with CPA funds. But generally speaking, um, there is the Magic Consortium that's based in Sudbury. Um, that's five towns. Or is that based in Hudson? I forget which is where, but there is a Sudbury um, regional housing services. And so there are a couple of models that have been springing up um, where towns are kind of banding together to help um, to help do this. Again, the one thing that I will say is that um, the one challenge with that is when you actually do want to start buying things and stuff like that, if they're the arm that does it, uh, people, again, it's the idea of local money leaving the town. And so that's the one thing that is just, everybody's got to got to be sensitive to it but it, you know if, it, if people are pretty good about sharing staff they just don't want to share the money and so it, I've been in trouble with, with doing this we've asked a few times in the past for people to for, well to regionalize like the housing specialist and things yeah. like that and nobody's nobody's wanted yeah. to join yet no because the neighboring towns do not have, have not passed the CPA Oh, that so they don't have a way to pay for it and that's what sterling they, and yeah. boils yeah. well, it's they don't the need to be contiguous they don't, the partnerships do not need to be contiguous. And so that's one other thing that I will say, and I will also say as a planner that's based in Boston, I work everywhere, so you, somebody will work in multiple towns. <laughs> I promise you we exist. <laughs> and so, um, so I wouldn't necessarily say look just at your contiguous neighbors. You might find well, that, them. Okay, and that was part of the problem. That might help you, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, you're, not, you're not the only one with the problem, you're not the only one with this issue in this neck of the woods, and so. Um, again, if it might not be your closest neighbors, but it might be totally cool people two towns over and new friends. Mm -hmm. New friends. <laughs> so if, um, if your affordable housing trust were um, thinking of taking on a role of, uh, as we talked about, converting existing units to market rate either by purchasing or having a program to help homeowners purchase homes and put deed restrictions on them, it would need to have a um, be have ready readily available funds in order to do that. So it would need to be capitalized with more than a year's worth of working revenue um, in order for that strategy to work. So increasing or sustaining a funding level uh, either out of CPA or finding another funding source to supplement um, the affordable housing trust funds would be needed in order to pursue that approach. We even have a client who passed a bond for affordable housing. You can find money in all varieties of places, but they decided to incur their own debt so that they could capitalize their trust. They don't have CPA, but they did just, they, so there's a variety of creative methods, but it is, um, it is important that the trust is not in a position every year to be asking for an appropriation and being unsure what that amount is going to be. You can't plan with that. And so, um, you know, and I know that that's, it is a political issue, but it is also something that significantly curtails the a trust ability to put together like a five-year plan or to think about what would we buy if we could, because, you know, you can't even think about buying. And so 
that's kind of there's a public education part that's um, that is that goes with that and so the next line is use education and training resources that's kind of the stuff that we're talking about is um, you know kind of getting the word out about how this works and that you know I don't mean to be so bad and um, and you know really kind of taking it from that approach um, because the funding the funding is you can't do anything without it. I'm not going to lie to you and say that you can. It's you great. It's great that you guys are. It's great that you guys have people who are. You have good, smart, like sincere people who are volunteering, and I hope that that continues. But I also think that it would help you guys to have a little more capacity. And um, you know, I think that you have, you have, you have all of the conditions to do some things. And so it's really just kind of getting it. You know, putting things in a line and then doing them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, we have, we've already talked about these roles in other previous slides. I was um, again looking yeah. at you know if there's anybody working in the region who actually looks like somebody you might want to spend time with because if you're going to develop with people, you will spend a lot of time with them. Um, approaching property owners and developers to look at what their plans are. Um, I've mentioned the Wachusett Plaza, uh, which is constrained by DCR regular, you know, with the DCR concerns. But again, it's kind of looking at um, Wachusett Plaza has the Planet Fitness and the Salter Top. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't tell. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I don't, you know, those are the kinds of places that we look at because those big, large retail spaces have very little demand. We don't have a new crop of retailers, you know coming up to take those spaces because they can't compete with online retail. Mm -hmm. And so big box is dead. We're not concerned. You know, you already got Walmart. The threat already came through. And now Walmart's trying to figure out how to survive. And the town needs to figure out what we're going to do with Walmart Plaza when they go away. Oh, boy. Have you noticed that their shipping looks a lot like Amazon these days? <laughs> but um, which isn't you know I'm, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom but I am saying that there's going to be some changes in retail and the way that your commercial space is used and what kind of demand there is for it and so we've seen major shrinkage in demand for large for the big spaces you know there's the smaller and leaner guys like Family Dollar and Dollar General that are doing okay and that's what we see growing but I don't see Blockbuster's not moving in you know Kmart's not coming to town and um, and they're not going to. And so, you know, you, we have these spaces, they're already developed, they're already paved over, what else can we do with them in their next life? That's something to think about. Maybe they're thinking about it too. I don't know, I haven't talked to them yet. Drone airport. <laughs> Could be, it's, it's super popular too. It's really interesting to regulate. The, <laughs> I'm telling you, the FAA regulations start getting in there and I love it when local zoning and federal regulations meet. It's totally interesting. But um, so again, approaching people, um, you know, the VFW hall is, uh, you know, it's owned by a guy whose family seems to build. I Googled him for a minute. But, you know, it's just like there are various people in town that I think probably um, really do have some interest. We just don't, you know, they just don't come to town hall and talk about it. And so it's just kind of like, okay, you know, it is a little bit of a drive by where it's just like, well, what's going on over there? But it's, that is, that is kind of the field research that gets you through it. Um, and the last thing again is ed educating the public and letting them know why we care and letting us, you know, it's not just 40B, it's not just, you know, it's not handouts, it's not this, it's not that, it's just, it's about housing diversity and people being able to live somewhere from cradle to grave. We don't always have to no. move. No. Okay, yeah. I think that's what we got. That's, <laughs> that's what we got, yeah. Yes. So, so the, the summary of like the housing production plan would be, uh, in my head, would it be something like we want to develop more senior housing because we have these family houses that, as the charts or something like that said, have a lot of one person dwellings, but they're actually, you know, three bedroom family houses. And if we could get the, the people who are single dwellers, give them some option, then maybe families could. That's kind of the idea, up. especially like, you know, we always get the question of, well, how do we make new housing more affordable? And the reality is that new construction has some fixed costs associated with and it's not going to be your cheapest housing. What we can do is change the supply of the housing and that should change um, some of the way that the demand impacts pricing. Because one of the things that we see a lot are senior households that are downsizing that are competing for the post-war ranches. Realistically, those aren't actually a great move either because they have way too, they have a lot of walls. 
They mm-hmm. never have a zero step entrance. The doorways are narrow. The bathrooms and the kitchens are galley. And so there's not a turning radius if somebody's in a chair. And so it's not, um, while it's smaller housing, it's not necessarily um, housing that is going to suit, you know, suit that demographic need the best. And so if we built senior housing that actually did have all the design things that, that, that housing needs, you know, not just, you know, draw, you know, lower kitchen countertops and that kind of thing. Again, because if you're in a wheelchair, you can't get to the top cabinets. You need, you need a house that works. <laughs> and, so, and so a lot of it is about making, you know, it's about, you know, addressing that, building a supply for that and shifting around who's living where and, you know, getting single person households who are overhoused out of those three bedroom houses and, and into maybe two bedroom units. What do you think about the, the senior, like the Angel Brook and the... Um, the CCRC? The okay. Continuing Care Retirement Community? No, no, no. No, no. no. no the... Um, that's what they're called. Our industrial that's area. Yeah. Oh, that, that's just... The, that's a private rental development, isn't yep. it? Mm-hmm. Well, no. condos. Oh, this ownership? And it's... They are CCRCs. Oh. Okay. okay. It's just no continuing care. Oh. <laughs> so it was permitted under the CCRC bylaw, and they didn't do any of the CC part, just the RC? I thought that was... <laughs> that. Yeah. Did you do that? Yes. No. Okay. All right, because okay, that that makes sense to me. Um, I think that those have a ton of demand. There's wait lists out the door for them, um, and so in spite of the fact that it's not again quote unquote affordable housing, it is super super popular, and we can't build enough of it. Yeah. And so one of the problems is is the stuff that's really well designed starts selling for eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and people get upset about that. But if you don't like kit it out in teak and marble and all of that, um, it, it it will help. <laughs> And if you drop parking requirements from like attached two car garages to a mix of like single car garages and two car garages and that sort of thing, that also helps. I wonder if you could speak to the gap between the 80% affordable and the fact that the Section 8 rents for Worcester County don't cover that because there's, there's an apparent need for people paying 30% of their adjusted income for, for, for housing. and. The Section 8 program can be a vehicle for that, but because the, uh, the that gap between the 80% medium and then the, the Section 8 free market rents, could, Thank you. is there a way of working that so that maybe we can increase the fair market rents? Or, or Unfortunately, we can't. I'd like to actually back up because not everybody might be um, familiar with Section 8, so I'm going to give a little bit of a... Um, understanding of what Section 8 housing is. So the so chapter there are two categories of affordable housing. The Chapter 40B affordable housing, it's as eight. we've been discussing, is um, housing that has a long-term deed restriction that makes it affordable to households earning 80% of area median income to pay no more than 30% of their income on housing. Section 8 works differently. It is a voucher provided by either the state or the federal government, mostly the federal government, um, that the household can take anywhere and rent a property and the government will pay the difference between 30% of their income and the asking rent. The there are also place-based Section 8 vouchers that do not travel with households but are uh, tied to a physical building. Um, and they work the same way that that the um, the rent is capped at 30% of the household income, no matter what they make there, um, and then the government pays the difference. The uh, problem is that the maximum rent that you can pay using that voucher is set by the federal government. Um, HUD establishes what they call fair market rent which is what they determine to be the maximum rent that you can use in that housing market to rent units with their vouchers. The fair market rent right now in the Worcester area that is your market is $200 below the section, the 40B 80% area median income. So you cannot use a section eight voucher to rent a 40B unit, it's not enough money. At 80% area median income. So this is another reason why the need is for a deeper level of affordability. If you had 50 or 60% area median income apartments under chapter 40B, the rents would be low enough to accommodate the um, they would Section be, 8 be, Because they'd be based holders. on, you know, 50% of the area median income instead of 80%. 
the issue with not being able to use Section 8 vouchers in 40B properties or the issue with not being able to income qualify local people because they either do not make enough or that they make too little to qualify for the units all has to do with the fact that there's very little subsidy for these units. And so either um, there's a couple of ways to adjust the math, but all of it involves subsidizing, whether you're subsidizing an individual, whether you're giving a developer a deeper subsidy um, on the building so that they'll uh, reduce the affordability or, you know, they you go from 80% to 50% to, or the 30%. Um, but that's math that does have to be adjusted. 40B math does not work in this market. And so, um, and so I'm not going to say anything to you otherwise. I'm just going to say that it is math that needs to be adjusted to make it work for you and your households. And that is something that can be done. Just on that topic, it seems like that's the problem whenever you're trying to uh, rent yeah. an affordable, you have to have a person who qualifies, doesn't make too much, but still can pay a mortgage or a rent. I mean, and it, there's like this little- It's a very narrow, gotta be in. we always say it's like 79.9% .9 AMI is the qualifying percentage right. and that's who affords, we don't, we, sorry, we, I'm on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever say that, uh, but, but no, it really does feel that way in effect when you're trying to qualify tenants and find yeah. them. Um, I think that there, there are kind of a few things that go into it. One is kind of, um, I think a lot of people who would qualify for affordable housing do not think that they do. Um, you know, again, it's the perception that it's for extremely indigent people and you're not thinking like 80% AMI. You're not thinking like, hey, we're blowing 90 here, we're doing pretty good. You're actually eligible, you know? And so, um, so part of it is kind of helping, again, spread awareness of it where it's just like, this is an option, you might actually qualify even if you don't think so. Um, and the other part is actually reaching people who do not, who don't know that any of this exists, you know, like, it, which is a pr most people, most people out there do not know that any of these, you know, you can Google where, you know, if you're having a housing crisis, you're checking Craigslist, you're not looking at your town's website. And so that's kind of the other thing is really r reaching people who, again. The other thing is that those, those same people are, they may qualify, it might be, it's a tough thing to, to do and get through that lottery. But they're really very close to the market rate rents also. I mean, so they just jump that's, over it. That's the other it. thing. And so this is one thing that I will say is that a developer is not obligated to charge the maximum rent that they can. They can reduce the affordable rates. But they and never that, do. You know, I actually have some that do. Oh, really? I do. You know, where we'll do a lottery once we can't, we can't qualify anybody. I go back to the guy and I say, I need you to drop that $200 and I can get you a tenant right now. Yeah. And that makes a difference. They'd rather get a tenant right now than wait for that 79%. Well, because it's the whole lottery to, process, yeah. it's the whole thing, and then you have, it reverts to the first eligible person, and it could, you know, they, for them, leaving a, ten, a unit untenanted is, you know, that for, you know, let's say it's an $1,800 unit a month, that's $1,800 that they are not getting. Granted, they're getting more on the other ones, but that's still, you know, that's money that they're missing. And so, um, so I have seen it happen. It's typically what we recommend. If we can't qualify someone, we go back to them and say, you need to make your math a little different for us. You have a question? Yes. yes. I just want to know if there was a way we could solve the Section 8 structural problem by either moving us into the Boston area or I thought at one point the regulations allowed for 20% over the FMR of this new construction. Is so, that still the case or not? I believe that is the case uh, on Section 8. I think the biggest issue is that there aren't really new vouchers and they're not doing play space with any frequency. And so um, it's, we don't, I'm going to be really blunt, I don't much look at it as a resource because the waiting list is so long and they're just not. Although I, I, um, I don't know if this is the same in your market, but closer to Boston, I've spoken with um, housing authorities that have vouchers that are going unused because of this problem. It's it's occurring throughout the state. It's not local to the Worcester right. area of this. The split between the housing market in general and the Section 8 rents are too low, but even the affordable units are too high for the FMR. And that's the federal government it's, it's their policy that is causing that structural problem. So I think you could petition to HUD, to DHCD, to let them know that this is a problem because um, they, they need to hear that as well. I know right to your congressman isn't exactly the most warm and fuzzy of solutions, but it is such a large 
systemic problem that this requires a big solution. This requires the, you know, this requires actually talking with our, you know, our local reps and getting involved with our state reps. Is you know, Section Eight public housing has kind of been marooned, and um, and we need it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We need it. This is, <laughs> and so um, and so it, you know, I I would like to be really rosy and say, you know, what if you just put in five dollars for every, you know, and that would be the thing that would solve it. But it is. Um, it's a huge issue, and there's only so much of the town's money that you can put into trying to resolve that gap, but it is a much bigger issue than just what you guys are going to be able there, to tackle. I want to um, add there are some communities that are trying to tackle that gap by using CPA funds for, a, for essentially um, a local voucher program that just covers the gap between for Section 8 households or that provides temporary assistance for households, say, coming out of homelessness, um, and then it expires after some time. But a program like that require, has a very high administrative need, and it would almost need to be operated by one of those regional nonprofits in order for it to work. So if that was an interest in your community, perhaps you could approach your regional nonprofit and see if they'd be interested in, in operating, although it might be a very small program in your community, well, we list your community resource, housing resources does do rental assistance. I'm not sure how tapped their programming is, but that, but again, it's, um, as Roberta said, rental assistance has really high administrative costs, um, and there are other providers um, that operate on a slightly larger level, and so their usual recommendation is not to do it locally, but to connect with the people who are doing it regionally. And whether you can help support them by, you know, adding addition, you know, additional cash to their subsidy for your residents or something like that might be an option, but um, again, because of the administrative costs, it's probably one of the better ones to see um, to <coughs> excuse me to talk <coughs> excuse me again to talk to the folks in Worcester okay mm -hmm. <laughs> nope nope not okay <coughs> yes I, I promised one of the selects <coughs> that I would bring up the request that the report have an executive summary yes of, of no more than two pages <coughs> I think we're up to <coughs> three Oh my God. Well, <laughs> it needs to be two. <coughs> this Excuse me. handout almost serves as a two-page executive summary. There's no explanation on the front of what the data is, um, so we may be able to um, replace some of this with just a description of what we found your housing needs to be. The back side of the handout summarizes the goals and the plan. In one page, so. Um, he should be satisfied with that. Okay. We can do a two-page summary. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this looks wonderful. I didn't see this. Is your presentation actually available too? Uh, we haven't had it posted yet, but typically we always just send it over, and if the town wants to, so okay. yeah, if the town wants to post it on their website, or we just email it out, whichever. Okay. And the full, so the report that you've seen to date, I know some of you have seen it. Thank you for those of you who've given me comments. Um, the, that is the, just the needs analysis portion of the report. And we'll be working on having the full completed draft to you by the beginning of next week at the latest, but our goal is the end of this week um, to have the full draft. It's amazing. We wanted to talk to you guys. We are making, to be fair, some assumptions along the way here, but nobody has said anything to the extent of you th that you think you were really off the mark. So, um, so we're we're glad about that, but we do want to, we you know we wanted to make sure that we were, had yeah. some things to actually talk to you guys so that we could get some feedback and try to finish this out for you to, in something that looks reasonable so that we can now edit it and go through that process. Mm -hmm. So to that point, for people who are watching tonight or may see this tomorrow, um, if if they have any questions or concerns, they should get those to me quickly yes. so that you have them in time to incorporate in that final draft. We yeah. have a very fast deadline due to grant funding, and so um, and so, we don't want to disenfranchise anybody, but if you want to participate, you need to participate quickly. And our so the, the next steps after this, our full completed draft, as I mentioned, will be out very soon. People can give feedback on that draft still. Um, the final draft, it will be a draft until down, um, until the end of the process. The final draft will be um, 
reviewed and needs to be adopted by the planning board and the board of selectmen and we anticipate that that will be scheduled in the middle of october october 17th i think we were the selectmen's meeting is october 17th and so we're going fast guys participate fast <laughs> Um, so the plan is required to be adopted by those two boards before it is submitted to the Department of Housing and Community Development. And when they've received it, um, they it get meets, 90 days to send comments. When it meets their approval, they approve it and then it is final and you um, have an approved housing production plan. That's the goal of this process. So typically the turnaround is, um, assuming everything goes smoothly for local adoption, we submit it to DHCD. They usually do not take 90 days to give comments, um, but they will send back comments that are addressed to us, the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, and the Town Administrator. Um, we'll discuss those comments on how we want to respond to them. We'll make appropriate edits uh, to the extent that they're necessary, resubmit it, usually DHCD will accept it. Um, and then from there you have your approved housing production plan that is on file with the state and the Department of Housing and Community Development. And then when you put your 14 units on the market, you can get that safe harbor. You apply for it. Paula helps with all of that. And, um, and so that's, that's kind, of the, kind of what we do moving forward. But in truth, it doesn't come in neat 14 units. Never. No, no wouldn't that be awesome though? No, no, 14 <laughs> units realistically. I mean, it'd be really cool if we could do um, something at like that veterinarian's office um, and get you like eight units there, do a rental project, get you two affordables, get list all eight, then we're halfway there. And then we need to just find another quick project like that. Yeah. And so, um, and they do count from the time that they are approved by the Board of Appeals or Planning Board, correct? It depends on permit. how they're permitted. So there's a different time. But theirs are going to be local action instead of comp permits because you guys don't want to do comp permits, I'm given to understand. And so yours are going to be local. Yeah. 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 And so you're going to permit under your local zoning, I'm going to assume. And it, and it counts as uh, based on the permit date, right? Uh, again, it, this, this is a question that we get asked all the time because some of it is, I think it's, it, not, it may be the permit date, it, uh, so the approval date, the permit date, it may be the date that the certificate of occupancy is granted. It depends the on town, how it's created. So. And the town also has a little bit of leverage as to when they ask to have it listed, so there can be some strategicness inserted there as well. And so, um, so they don't necessarily have to be built on the ground and inhabited for you to count them. Right. And so yeah, that's the other thing. that with this and so, and you know, when um, 87 Maple is good to go, you'll be, you know, that's also going to be, because um, it'll take a little time, I imagine, for them okay. to get their credits together and all of that. But the, when you count, it can, um, it could help you how you count. Mm -hmm. Pays to be strategic. That's another Paula area. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Anything fun? <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming. If you have questions and comments, obviously, be, don't be shy to get in touch. Um, and again, I uh, will be seeing the selectmen on the 17th. It's going to be a really good time. Tell your friends. Pack the room with positive people <laughs> who are happy about housing. Uh, but So that will be the next stop. Again, uh, we're anticipating a full draft out next week, um, so feel free to comment and let us know. And again, uh, the quicker you participate, the more it's going to make it in, and almost every person who participates does get it in, into the plan, I will say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. Okay. Good night. Thank you guys so much for coming. Terrific presentation. Yeah. It was insightful. I mean, it well, thank you. <laughs> That's so nice. Oh.